Okay, so we're here to wrap up the card allotment, which is going to bring us to the last faction group of the unified orc war clans, which is the blood orcs. But before we do that, um, I did notice that last time, because we had moved this piece of equipment around, we had skipped over looking at Broadshade Sword of Timber. So I just kind of wanted to resolve that before we move on and take a look at our Blood Orcs. Um, the Sword of Timber is a weapon attachment. It's going to require that you have a unit with the melee ability in order to use it. Uh, it's got a cost of 7 cunning, and um, it's going to double the combat of the attached unit, which, you know, I kind of like these cards that have uh, kind of a scale of usefulness. I mean, it's always going to be better than not having it. But if you have a unit who's offering one combat, well, then it's going to grant you one combat. But if you have a unit that has four combat, it's going to grant you four combat. So it scales with the game. As you go deeper into the game, it's going to become more powerful as you have more powerful units. So um, I like that aspect uh, to this card. And um, it's a wooden broadsword with gold reinforced shaft up the center and a gold leaf etched uh, hilt okay so it's this combination of like uh, wood and metal okay so it's a wood sword but it's I guess um, reinforced with with metal okay so that's it for that um, we're gonna head to the blood orcs now um, let's check out the notes and see what we have for them there's no faction leaders just yet um, purchase many cards with combat so we spoke last time about this that it's possible for uh, orcs sometimes to recruit using combat, basically browbeating uh, a unit into um, participating. The blood orcs especially are going to be able to do this. This is very, very common in their culture. Uh, might makes right kind of thing. Um, uh, high use of card destruction. All right. I mean, you're getting the picture for what these guys are about. Um, high combat single units. Uh, they're not as much um, of an organized uh, faction group like you had with the Xanthan Orcs. It's going to be that their single units can be very strong on their own, uh, but they don't gain big advantages in being in groups per se. Um, many attacks. So, you know, we saw that the Dwarves were rather defensive, and they're going to have a lot of evade cards. The Blood Orcs are going to have more attack cards than evade cards. Um, unit defense is often higher than cost uh, because they're savage warriors. They're very um, adept at fighting, so it's going to be hard to take them down. I mean, they're the kind of orcs that, you know, you chop an arm off and they're still coming at you. So that's going to be reflected in defense. Um, their ability to be brought down, basically. Um, all units have the melee proficiency and often the range proficiency as well. So we're saying that all units are going to have this melee proficiency. So you're not going to have to go hunting for someone who can use a sword or something like that. They're all going to be able to do this. This is, you know, I mean, you come of age, you learn how to fight. All right. So um, the first piece, of, uh, first piece of equipment is the Bone Charm Belt. And it's an armor attachment that anybody can use. Uh, it's got a cost of seven, a defense of seven. The attached unit gains combat equal to the number of units in your captured pile up to five. So let's just get a sense of what this is about. Close up of blood orc female hand draped over belt that sits low on waist with five small bone fragments dangling. That blood orc female is Reyna, the blood orc mercenary. Just a little something to remember you by. With take a finger or a scapula or who knows what. It's a bone charm belt. Okay, so this is going to be, um, you know, like notches on the belt. Uh, the more, you know, uh, enemy, the more opponents, units you brought down, the stronger you're going to be by using this card. Now, last time we said that the Blood Orcs were a male-dominated society. But there are cases where a female um, emerges, and it's it's... Like I said, it's might makes right. So if you get somebody comes along and they beat you down, doesn't matter male or female, you know, they got it over you. And that's going to be respected in time, okay? And Reyna is uh, one of the most powerful warriors of the Blood Orc faction. Um, 
and so we'll be you know seeing her at some other point. I don't know that I wrote her in yet. We'll see. We have we have quite a few cards for the for the blood orcs. I don't remember them all, but um, she's definitely going to wind up in here, whether um, as a captain most likely, um, or just a very strong unit. We'll see. I might have written her in already. I don't remember. Okay, so we'll go to the tactics. Forced march. Okay, so three cost. Um, defensive four as tactics have it's going to give you one combat on its own you're just pressing a little bit so you're getting that little bit of an extra fighting power and uh, when you launch an assault against a fortified location you may place your marching token on the one side so if you remember um, you place the marching token on the two side uh, the following turn it goes to the one side and then the following turn the assault resolves here you're going to cut that back by one it's a forced march. We're going to get there a little bit quicker. Okay. You may also destroy this card to resolve the assault immediately instead. So it's uh, how forced is this march going to be? Okay. You could either just use this card to get the one side and then keep it because, you know, you may want to do that again in the future. You may want to keep it for its one combat. Um, but then if you destroy it, you can resolve an assault immediately. So if you have a really important assault, you feel like you really got the drop on the enemy, you're going to get your guys out there quickly and try and make that assault happen right away. Where there's a whip, there's a way. Anybody know where that's from? <laughs> if you know where that's from, leave it in the comments. Um, Alright, so that's Forced March. Um, pillage, another tactic of the Blood Orcs. Eight, Cunning. Now, we said that we're going to be able to make purchases with combat. That's only going to apply to uh, units. You're not going to be able to buy tactics with combat. That doesn't make any sense. It's, it's that browbeating idea. That's why you can do it with units. Um, for each equipment card in the active field, you may choose to acquire it or destroy it. Um, I had some trouble with the wording of this, uh, but I think this is pretty clear at this point. I, I wanted you to be able to do this for each card. Make a decision. If, if your enemy, your opponent, has some equipments out in the active field, you have some equipments out, for each one you can say, all right, I'm going to take this one, I'm going to destroy that one. You can do it affecting all of the equipments. Um, and you can make that choice on a case-by-case -case basis. But I had a lot of trouble with the wording because it always seemed like, you know, initially I said like, um, you know, like for each equipment card in the active field, you may acquire or destroy it. Uh, and it kind of felt like you could either destroy all of them, acquire all of them, but you couldn't do some this way, some that way. So let me know if you think this is clear. For each equipment card in the active field, you may choose to acquire it or destroy it. I think by putting this in the singular and for saying each here, it lets you know that you're going to make case-by-case -case basis. You're going to go through and look and make your decision. In addition to that, Pillage is going to allow you to destroy this card to place up to three equipment cards from your discard pile into your hand. So, gathering up a bunch of a bunch of stuff. Take all you can carry and destroy the rest! That's from Dolor the Hot Stormer, who we're going to see him a little bit later. Okay, so Pillage. Again, see how the flavor just comes out right away with these Blood Orcs. Forced March. Pillage. Now we have a Blood Orc Shaman. This is the first of the basic units for the Blood Orcs. Um, as usual, they're going to have three, and uh, the Shaman is going to give them some magic proficiency. So it's one combat, two cunning. they got a little bit of combat in there, because Blood Orcs, even their magic guys, you know, you're going to get some combat. This is just part of their culture. But mostly you're going to get cunning from a magic unit. Um, the defense is three, and uh, they can be used to fortify, and that's all that we have for them at this point. It may be all they ever have. You know, I didn't want every single card necessarily to have an ability. I do tend to do that. It's just how I think. I think of a Blood Orc Shaman, I think of what he does, and I throw in an ability. Um, uh, the Blood Orcs are a pretty simple, you know, culture. You know, so I didn't want to necessarily have an ability on every card. I'm not sure where I sit on that. Um, if I do, um, you know, keep abilities off some of these cards, I would want to make sure that happens in the other faction groups as well, here and there. I don't want it to be like they're the only ones who don't have abilities, but they may have less cards with abilities. I don't want their play to be less strategic, though. So I'd want to make sure that there's, you know, I don't know, just throwing something out there. I wouldn't do this probably, but let's say you had a, a tactics card that said, you know, 
cards with no abilities gain plus one combat or something like that. You know what I mean? Something to to give it a purpose other than just omitting it. And then it's like, oh, I'm playing the Blood Orcs. I'm not going to have as much fun. You know, we got to give it some kind of uh, some kind of meat to it to make it feel, you know, interesting. Um, and then we have Blood Orc Warrior. Straight up three. That is a lot for a basic unit to have. Three combat... Um, and remember, these cards have a variable cost depending on the faction leader. Um, so you might be getting this three for two, or three for three, which is cheap. Um, and it has a four defense. It can fortify, but it doesn't have an ability. So you see how, you know, we're trying to kind of, if it's not going to have an ability, then it it's going to be worth it because it has this extra combat. It's got to be something going on to, to make that work. Um, and then the Blood Orc Weapon Master. This unit may have two weapons attached. And it also gives you this three. Okay, so um, now you're going to say, well, what's up with that? This guy gives you three and, and has nothing. And this guy gives you three and then he has this ability. That's not fair. Well, it doesn't have to be fair because... First of all, it's randomized, this. So it's like, yeah, sometimes you're going to pick something and you're going to like it better than something else. So that's okay. I don't mind that too much. But I would want to balance it somehow. Um, and we're balancing it by the fact there's only two of these, whereas there's four of these. So this is going to come up much, much less frequently. It's going to be like, you know, um, getting a prize in a Cracker Jack box that you actually like for whatever reason. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? So it's going to come up less often. It's going to be more rare that you're going to get this card, but when you get it, it's going to be like, oh, win, you know? Okay, so we'll, we'll see, though. This stuff's all got to get worked out. Um, okay, now into the faction deck. We have the Backstabber. Four, combo cunning again. Um, any combination of both is what this usually means. This could get overpowered, though, right away. So I may make it or. So you have to choose one or the other. Because if it's always going to be and or, it's really not fair. They're going to be really, recruitment's going to be very easy for them. Um, uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of um, dampen that decision as to what cards to purchase. Because it's like, hey, combo cunning, it's all the same to me. You know, there are other considerations, obviously. You still have to balance combo cunning and an assault. You know, you do have other things like, you know, when you, when you try and capture an opponent's unit, it has to be combat. You can't use cunning. Um, but, you know, we don't want to kind of just all of a sudden make this a one-resource uh, faction group. You know what I mean? So, um, this backstabber gives you two or two. You can choose which one you're going to use. A backstabber is a shifty, crafty kind of character, so you get that cunning. And then he has, you know, moderate combat value. Um, it can be used to fortify as a melee end range proficiencies. Again, that versatility kind of reflecting this shifty nature. Um, and uh, discard the top card of any player's deck. All right, so it's just a little backstab at you, like, you know, going to make you discard a card. Okay, pretty simple. Then we have the Blood Reader, which is a magic unit. Cost is six cunning. All right, so you're not going to be able to browbeat the Blood Reader. He's, he's one of these guys who's like, you know, he's a spiritual, magical character. It's like, you know, kill me if you will, you know what I mean? I'm not going to do what you want. I have grand, you know, I answer to a higher authority kind of a thing. All right, so you got to get him with cunning. Got to talk him into uh, getting you to do what, what you want him to do. But he's only got four defense because, again, a lot of times with the magic units, we bring that defense just down a little bit because they're not strong fighters. They're a little bit vulnerable out there. Um, he can fortify and reveal the top card of any player's deck. You may immediately purchase the card or return it to the top of the deck. Okay, so... Um, I think we saw this uh, in the men faction with the auger, or was it? Where did we see this? I think it was with him. Um, let's go out here and just take a quick look. Reveal the top card of the opponent's faction deck. You may purchase it or return it to the top of the deck. Okay, so that's the same ability. Um, let's see. Now, that's a basic unit for the men. And um, here it is a faction deck unit. So there may only be one of these, let's say. Whereas the basic units for the men, it's going to be uh, more prolific. Also, with basic units, they're available at all times. The Blood Reader's got to come out of the uh, faction deck into the active field in order for you to purchase them. So it's going to be a little bit harder to get. Um, I guess I don't really have a problem with this, as long as these numbers are different. I do not like having two cards that are the same with a different name and different art. 
That never. I never like to do that. So there's got to be some difference between these two. I'm going to have to look at them a little bit more closely and make sure that that difference is significant enough. Otherwise, I'll change one of them. Um, okay, so the blood reader. Uh, and just to give you this image, the sorceress red orc seeing visions in a cauldron of blood, feet dangling from off camera, dripping a drop that is hitting the pool. So you can imagine he's got some guy strung up over this cauldron and he's bleeding him to fill this cauldron and do his readings. Alright, so pretty gruesome. Hey, they're blood orcs. You knew what you were getting into. Alright, so now we have the cutthroat. Uh, four cost card. Um, gives you two combat and one cunning. Um, the backstabber gave you two and two. The cutthroat's going to give you a little bit more combat than cunning because the backstabber implies a little bit more cunning. Cutthroat is a little bit more direct, right? But you see he's got this uh, higher defense than cost, which um, the backstabber doesn't have. Okay, and he can fortify, he's got melee and range. You may pay the defense of one unit card in any player's discard pile to destroy it. So, typically, you'd only be able to um, get at an opponent's units while they're in the active field, and you would capture them and put them in your capture pile, which would give you victory points at the end of the game. So that's important to note, that these cards that you're capturing, because you may say, well, this is war, why don't you just destroy you know, every unit when you attack it in the active field? Well, you're capturing them, and it's giving you those victory points. It's representing part of your victory. All right, so, and you know, you might want to enslave them or something where you're going to waste good resources, right? So, um, in this case, they're going to destroy it. So that is kind of a double-edged sword. It's, it's kind of uh, a cost that you're paying because you're not getting that victory point, all right? But it is balanced by the fact that you're getting access to this card while it's in the player's discard pile. It's a card that they purchased, and you're gaining access to it. You're not going to be able to steal it away. See, they would have had it as victory points at the end of the game had they kept it in their deck. You're not going to get to steal that and get the victory point, but you're going to get to deprive them of it. All right? So it's, it's going to have that net effect of one. Let's say it's a victory point one card. They're not going to have that one, but you're not going to gain one to get that net effect of two. You see what I mean? So this is giving you access to to uh, the, 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 play, the, the other player's discard pile, which is pretty cool, um, but you have to pay the cost. You have to be able to, f to defeat that unit. And you can also choose an opponent to reveal their hand, choose one card to be placed on top of their deck. All right, so I just wanted the, the cutthroat to kind of just be getting at you a little bit. He's getting in your discard pile, he's getting in your hand. You know, he's, he's really aggressive, you know, directly toward another player. Okay, and now here's Dolor, the Hearthstormer. We saw him before with his quote on the Pillage card. Uh, he's a six-cost cunning. All right, so you're not going to be able to not going to be able to browbeat Dolor because he's you know he's been through that before. You know he's seen them all before. He's like, okay, tough guy. You know what I mean? Bring it on. You want to kill me? Kill me, kind of thing. Um, you're going to have to kind of get him on board with cunning. Uh, but he's three combat and two cunning. These are very strong numbers because you could use either one. So he's got that versatility in addition to, you know, decent numbers on each. Um, he's got the seven defense because, like we said, blood orcs typically, unless there's a, uh, a reason why we would change it, they're going to have that higher defense. Um, and he has the melee range proficiency. He can be used to fortify. And you may pay the defense of one equipment card on any player's discard pile to destroy it. So similar to the cutthroat, but we're dealing with equipment because the Hearthstormer is, a, is a, like a, a robber, a pillager. right? So he's going to get in there and uh, destroy your equipment. We're never going to let you, you know, take the opponent's cards because the faction groups are different. So as much as with equipment, it would make sense. You know, why can't I just steal this guy's sword and then how cool is that? I have one of the elf swords in my deck. That would be really cool. I, I just, um, I don't feel comfortable mixing up the cards so much. When you, when you destroy an opponent's card, it goes to the destroyed pile. So that destroyed pile is going to be mixed up and you got to sort it out at the end of the game. But it's its own separate thing. When you capture a unit, it's going to go into your captured pile. But that captured pile is going to be all your opponent's units. So you just hand it back to them at the end of the game and they could sort it out amongst themselves. I don't like the idea of just like mixing you know, group, you know, different faction group cards in your deck. It just, I don't know, something about that sits with me wrong. What do you think about that? 
I mean, it would be really cool to have an elf sword, you know, in your deck that you stole. You know, I like that. That's fun. And I mean, is it a big deal to really just sort everything at the end of the game? But it could get pretty messy. You know how it is at the end of a game. You don't really want to sort everything as it is. And now you'd have a lot to sort out because you got to go through and make sure, you know, we'd have to, we probably should uh, make some notation on every card with a little icon where it belongs anyway. But you'd have to go through that all. You might have cards from, you know, three different groups, your own. And if you're facing two other opponents, you might have men and elves and your own cards all mixed in. And then you got the faction cards that have to be removed from your specific faction group cards to be put back. There'd be a lot of sorting at the end of the game. And that's why I don't permit it. But what do you think about that? Is it cool enough to make it worthwhile? Um, Is it okay to... uh, you know, give you all that trouble at the end of the game for a better play experience. I'm not really sure where, where, you know, where I sit on it, although I very much lean in the direction of not doing it, just because it seems like it gets messy. Um, okay, so yeah, he Dolor is going to be about equipment, and he's going to get you two. Now, why is he getting you two? We said last time we were basically using seven cost <coughs> as uh, the, the justification for increasing the VP. Let's see, he's got three here. Can't really see bumping him up to seven with this ability. So, I guess we'd have to kind of bring him down to one here. A lot of times, um, named characters kind of get the edge a little bit. You you know, you're capturing, uh, like, a notorious opponent, and so you would get that higher VP. But I don't know if I could justify it here. I think early on, you know, last time we spoke about this... I said that I was using the higher of the two as a base cost. Initially, I was doing it one and a half times. So this would be three plus one and a half, which would round up to two, which would be a base cost of five, plus the ability would give you the six. So this may be what happened here with him and the way it panned out. I'm not really sure. But again, all of this stuff is going to get changed, so we'll see. For now, we're going to leave him at one because he's at six cost. And now the Seething Bloodletter. This is a beast. Okay, let's take a look at what it's like. A trained, armored, lion-like beast with two hooked, razor-sharp protuberances from shoulder that can swipe horizontally, plus very long, sharp claws and many Nexu-like shredding teeth. Okay, so it's got like these two hooks coming out of its shoulders that can kind of catch you, and then it can bite you up and claw you up and all of that. So the seething blood letter, you can see why it's a blood letter. It's got hooks and teeth and claws and all these shredding kind of uh, uh, features. All right, so eight cost, pretty high, but like any beast, you can tame it with a whip. So it's going to have that combat or cunning. Coax it, beat it into submission, do what you got to do. Combat four, very strong, no cunning, of course. Um, and it's going to have equal cost and defense as a beast. Can't fortify with it. It doesn't have any proficiencies. When you capture a unit, you may destroy it instead. Now, why would you do that? Because if you do, you gain one influence. So remember, when you capture a unit, you're going to get the victory points at the end of the game. Why would you destroy it instead? To get this influence. And influence, um, not only is it an in-game uh, resource that you could use to activate captain abilities, activate abilities on other cards, which I don't know if I have any cards yet that use it. I might have one somewhere, we'll see. Um, but also, they're worth victory points at the end of the game. So your influence tokens, if you don't spend them, they will be worth victory points. So this, you're not losing the victory point. You, you are, in theory, getting it, and what's better, you could spend it if you need to during the game. All right, so the eight cost is getting it a VP of two. Alright, let's go next to the Relentless Aggressor. <laughs> cost 7, Com 3. Now you're seeing these pretty strong combat values on a lot of these cards for the Blood Orcs, right? That's by design. And then we have the uh, higher defense over cost, which is a feature of the faction group. Can fortify, has the melee ability, and whenever this card would go to your discard pile, you may place it at the bottom of your deck instead, because he's relentless. So he's not going to wait to come out next time around. He goes right to the bottom of the deck and you're going to get him again. Now, this kind of creates um, a loop because he's never going to go to your discard pile. Every time he would go to your discard pile, he's going to the bottom of your deck. So he's never going to be out in the discard pile. He's going to keep coming back and back and back. But remember, he's at the bottom of your deck, so you're still going to... Let's say you only have two cards at the bottom of your deck. You're going to draw those two. You're still going to reshuffle your discard pile, make a new deck, and at the end of the turn, he's going to go to the bottom of it. So he's not going to come out again all the way until that deck gets played through. So it's not like he's coming out every turn. You know what I mean? So I thought this was fair enough. 
Um, but once you get him out, he's never going to the discard pile again. Which is good because some things that target your discard pile, he won't be available. That's also bad because sometimes you have abilities that target your discard pile, let you grab a unit or something like that. You're not going to be able to grab him. He He's going to come out when he comes out. And you're not going to have any control over that. Um, so, you know, it's kind of weighed out on both sides. He, av- he avoids your opponent's uh, discard targeting abilities, but he also uh, is not available for yours. Okay, and now the captains. And there's Reyna, so we do have Reyna here in the captains. Um, Ragehound Whirlblade. Uh, defensive 11. When he arrives, he destroys any unit in your opponent's row that is adjacent to another unit. Okay, so if you just happen to have three units out in the active field, he's going to get all three of them. If you just have um, two, he's going to get both of those. If you just have one, he's not going to get anybody. Okay, but it's this idea of World Blade. He just comes out like the Tasmanian Devil with two swords sticking out. You know, <laughs> just kind of clipping everybody who, who's out there. Um, I, I don't love the fact that he may arrive to no effect if you don't have, if the opponent doesn't have adjacent units out on the field. That would kind of be anticlimactic. It's like he's just like spinning out in the middle of an empty field, and it's like, what's with this guy? Um, so we want to make sure it's like, you know, he's going to get somebody. We'll, we'll see about that. And then it gets tricky with the wording and whatnot. Um, you know, then we have to say, if no units are adjacent. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. So we'll see about it. Um, but I, I don't like things just being a dud. I never like that. When you, when you get a card, it should do something. When it has an effect, it should do something. Um, then each turn, each opponent reveals their hand, discarding the units that have the same cost as another unit. Now, you see, this is okay. I don't mind if this turn ability falls flat, because sometimes it's going to fall flat, other times it's going to take two units, because any unit that has the same cost as another unit, that other unit has the same cost as it, so it's going to get none, or it's going to get two, or maybe more, you see, so it's, you know, it's a trade-off in that way, I'm okay with that, because this is coming up every single turn, this arrive is only happening once, it should do something. Um, but the turn is happening every single turn. Sometimes it's going to hit, sometimes it's not. That's okay. Um, but this going to use have the same cost value. See, because I want it to be value. Because if you have, you know, maybe you have a unit that could be bought with combat, maybe you have a unit that could be bought with cunning, and then you say, well, that's not the same cost. Well, here it's the same value, the numerical value. Regardless of what resource it is, that's going to apply. It gives it a little bit more um, effect. All right, and then you could activate him by spending an influence point, one influence point. That's what this number is here. Some activated abilities may require more than one. This one only requires one. Gain combat equal to the number of units in the opposing faction's row. So again, we're dealing with this idea of multiple units with World Blade. Um, so if there's a lot of units in the row, he's going to do a lot of damage, right? Um, or you're going to gain that calm. So, in effect, you're going to have that damage available to you. But, you know, the more people there are, the more people get hurt with World Blade. Um, now, and here we have a quote from uh, Bertram Moore, Battlefield Strategist, who we saw Bertram in the, uh, the um, Canton Fields Brigade cards. And his quote says, He just sent three heads rolling in a single swipe. Sheathe your swords and call the archers. Right? So we're not going to go in there and try and mess with this guy. We're going to try and shoot him from a distance. All right, so Bertram Moore coming up again there. VP6 on this guy. And he's a monstrous, fury-possessed warrior orc, predator-looking with two blades. This is uh, predator as a proper noun because we're talking about the predator. All right, so you have that idea of, like, you know, the dreadlocks and maybe he's wearing a mask or something. I don't know, something like that. All right, with two blades. And now we have Reyna, who we spoke about before. Defense, 10. When she arrives, each opponent reveals their hand and discards all unit with three combat or less. All right, so it's like you can't touch her. If you're not strong enough, she's going to get you. Okay. Uh, Each turn, you may reveal your hand and discard all units to destroy one unit in the active field. So you're going to be able to um, get rid of units to destroy one of your opponent's units. And again, you'd want to do this typically if it's a powerful unit out there that you can't afford to uh, capture. Well, she's going to be able to destroy it. Okay, now the idea with her is that she works alone. All right, and uh, we're going to see this with her quote. You swine can take what I leave behind. Steal my kill and I'll cut you at the knees. 
right? So she works alone. She don't want to hear it. You know, the men, she's, she's got nothing for them. All right. She's had to deal with a lot as a, as a female in the blood or culture. So she's doing her own thing. And you can activate for two influence her ability. But look, plus six calm and or cunning. That's huge. Now, remember that these influence tokens are going to be in pretty short supply. If you've been following us through the entire card allotment, you see that there's not that many cards that give you influence. So this isn't going to come up very often where you have um, a lot of influence tokens. Um, but And, you know, they're going to be spent and then they're gone. So you're not going to be able to do this all the time. But when you can do it, you're going to get six of whatever you want. So that's pretty cool. And she's got five VP... Um, if you can, uh, if you can capture her. All right. Now that's it for the card allotment. So we made it through all the way to the end. Um, let's see where we are. Okay, we're at thirty minutes. That's fair enough. Um, I do want to mention the last thing because I'd hate to start a whole new video on this. Um, um, what's in my notes? What I did is I went to the. Uh, I, I think it was the f the core game of the DC deck builder, and I tried to break down everything that I saw there. And um, I did that because I feel like I'm kind of out on a limb here. I don't really know, um, you know, what the relative value should be and this and that. So I did this as a way of getting a baseline. How did they do it? What did they come up with? And then I can, I can work from there and try and figure it out. I can go a little bit more with one thing, a little bit less with another thing, make sure it kind of balances out to numbers that are, you know, somewhere in this vicinity. And that would give me a good starting point for uh, playtesting the game. And then from there I can adjust and... and see where I want it to be for this particular game. But at least this gives us somewhere to start as, as uh, you know, amateur designers who, who maybe never did this before. We get to look at what the pros are doing, and uh, it gives us a good starting point. So um, this was fun to do, and uh, I think it's a good process. You know, when we don't have a lot of experience and we need to try and learn, you know, how do we come up with these numbers for these cards and get the game at least some kind of, uh, balance in place before we even start playtesting, so that way, you know, we're not wasting a lot of time, you know, we can at least start with some footing, you know, so you saw that 84% of the cards were worth one victory point in that game, uh, only 10% were worth two, and then 1% were worth three, 5% had a variable VP value, okay, so most of the cards are having that one VP uh, value, all right, now that makes sense, why why make these numbers bigger if you don't have to? I mean, we got to add them up at the end of the game, so you want to keep it as simple as possible. So we keep this base down at 1. I mean, we could easily make this 5 and 10 and 15, but why would we make the math harder, right? So we get it down to the lowest possible numbers we can. Um, oh, and here we did... Okay, so this is the Heroes Unite set. Okay, so... Um, and that's how we had 111 cards. 5% of them were locations. 14% were uh, superheroes. 24% were equipment. 28% were the regular hero cards. Um, and what is this? 29%? 31% of heroes. No, 32, 31 heroes and 32 heroes. Hmm. I'm wondering if I have a typo here. Okay. I'm gonna, uh, one of these would have to be villains. All right. So they're both kind of the same number anyway. So let's just say that. All right. So heroes and villains. Um, and then the uh, cost breakdown. One power. Uh, there were two cards that cost one power. There were 21 cards that cost two power. And then you could see how these numbers break down, that you have a high number of uh, three, four, and five power uh, cost cards. Okay, so that's kind of where most of the cards are going to sit in terms of their cost. Now, this is going to be different for this game because we have two resources, okay? And what's nice about the uh, Cerberus Engine deck builders is that it has the one resource. That keeps it simple, fast, and easy. And it also makes it um, easy for us to break it down. But when we're looking at two resources, we have to realize that um, that's going to reduce the amount that each player has of each of those resources. So these costs are going to have to reflect that. So these numbers are going to be a little bit different. Um, and then you had very few cards as you got up into the 6, 7, and 8 range. You only had one card with 8 power cost. And then the power cost breakdown, the number of cards, uh, the power granted, plus any effects they had. This gets a little weird to kind of figure out because effects are very variable, and it's hard to kind of uh, put a value on them and stuff like that. But, you know, um, there were two cards that granted one power plus an ability. You see what I mean? So, and that's, you know... 
these numbers are going to be the same. These are the one power cost cards. There's two of them. We noted that over here, right? And then for the two power cost cards, there are 21 of them. And you see two of them granted one power plus an attack. Four of them granted one power, one power plus defense. Four of them granted two power. So you can start to see how, you know, um, what the costs were relative to what the card can do and how many of each there were. Okay, so we're not going to get into this, but I just wanted to show you this um, as an option you have. Because typically we're inspired to create a game based off uh, another game that we played. And, um, you know, we, we liked the game, but we saw uh, opportunity to do something different with it. Well, maybe we wanted to kind of combine things that we saw in various different games. I mean, you could see in this game there's touches of uh, High Command, uh, there's touches of Rune Age, obviously the uh, Cerberus Engine games. Um, you know, so a, a lot of ideas that I liked from other games, I kind of molded and mutated into something that can work together. So typically, I think that's where the design process starts for a lot of us. Uh, our entrance into the, the endeavor itself usually begins that way, where we're writing customized rules um, for other games, um, and maybe we'll talk about that in the future. But breaking down a game and taking a look at it, you know, they always say, you know, to be a good writer, you should read a lot, and to be a good designer, you should play a lot of games. Well, playing a lot of games is great, and of course, it gives you a, um, a, a solid footing to proceed from when you have that experience, but what about even deepening your knowledge of those games that you play by breaking them down and seeing how many of this card, how many of that card, what are the costs, what are the numbers? Because isn't that the big question is like, you know, we get all this general um, uh, advice about how to create games, but that nitty gritty down and dirty, how do I number this card? How many cards should have, you know, um, an attack? How many cards should have a defense? This gives you some kind of a baseline to kind of start from. So anyway, if you watch all these videos, thank you so much. I hope that, uh, you know, it helps somehow. And we'll see where we go from here. We have a lot more to talk about. But that's all we got for Recitals of Redemir the Orc Tide right now. So thanks for checking in. I'll see you again soon.